uh, journalism industry is undergoing uh, a lot of changes, no matter where you are, no matter what country you're in. Um, the concept of mobile journalism, which I'll talk about, um, it certainly is different in every country. So for example, I have found here in the United States, uh, there's a lot more of it compared to other countries. For example, when I was teaching a mobile journalism class recently in Italy, um, that was not something that was um, really part of the curriculum there. Um, as your professor said, I am currently in a city called Syracuse, New York. Uh, a little bit about my background and then I'll dig into uh, my presentation uh, and then I'll open it up for, for questions. So um, I knew from an early age that I wanted to be a journalist. Uh, I remember the first time actually walking in a, a television newsroom and I thought, wow, this is amazing, right? Like I get to um, interview, travel, learn information first and then present it to people. Um, and what a powerful uh, kind of job that is and uh, important responsibility. So at a very young age, I knew I wanted to be a journalist and I followed that path. Um, Following my uh, undergrad, I was a, a broadcast journalist, so mostly in TV um, for the majority of my professional career. And then about six years ago, I transitioned from being a full-time journalist to uh, teaching journalism um, full-time now. And I'm at Ithaca College, which is here in, in New York State. Um, so this idea of mobile journalism and this idea of how technology is impacting um, journalists uh, across all different forms of journalism. Um, for me, this has been an area of interest uh, from the very beginning. So I've always found myself to be an early adopter of new technology uh, and always experimenting with how technology can help us as journalists better deliver uh, the news to people and also connect us in ways we haven't um, had before. And so that's a little bit of what, what kind of has brought me to, uh, to this point. Let me share my screen and I'll um, go through my presentation. Uh, let's see here. I'm gonna share sound, uh, share, and let me open my uh, PowerPoint. On the first slide, feel free to contact me at any time uh, after this presentation. Um, so I have, and I'm happy to, to share this with you guys afterwards, I have um, all my contact information uh, here. Um, the image on the right-hand side is actually the second edition of my, uh, of my book, which just came out um, about two weeks ago. I actually don't even have a physical copy yet. I have not yet received a copy of it. Um, so I'm waiting to get that in my hands. Um, but here you have my information, uh, my Twitter handle, as well as my uh, Gmail. Um, so please, 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 if you have any questions after this, feel free to, um, to uh, reach out to me at, at any point. I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions you might have. Um, so just a couple of things I hope to cover in the next, I would say, 40 minutes or so, and then I'll open it up for, for questions. Um, what is mobile journalism or Mojo as we call it? Uh, choosing the proper gear. And I actually have with me here the gear that we use um, at my university and that the students use as part of my mobile journalism class. Uh, give you some tips on recording audio with your phone, uh, your mobile device, and also shooting and editing, editing video briefly touch on uh, creating videos with graphics and titles. And then as you all know, um, these tappable, tappable vertical videos, the, the Instagram story type videos um, are quite popular now and certainly um, a area of, of mobile journalism, social media journalism that most news outlets are now uh, putting a lot of time and effort into. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, give you guys some tips about that. Let me take a few steps back though, before we get into that. So how did mobile journalism kind of begin at least with the iPhone, right? The iPhone came out, what was it, 2007? So really not all that long ago. And so 
it was around 2011, um, so about four years after the iPhone came out, that um, some news outlets here in the US at least um, started realizing the potential for using uh, this kind of device to actually produce content. And so this here uh, was actually a video report done by the New York Times. Um, and this was their first video story ever produced with an iPhone. And for us in the United States, um, you know, this seemed uh, pretty incredible at the time, right? Because as you, you know, the New York Times is considered this legacy international news outlet. Um, and so who would have thought that one day they would be using for some of their content, uh, an iPhone to shoot video and produce uh, a video story. So this was 2011. Um, certainly over time, the quality of mobile devices, the video has gotten better, right? And so over time, as the quality of the video, as the quality of the audio has gotten better, um, and as the cost of these devices have come down, news outlets around the world have realized that, wow, we have right here in our hands, this simple device can be a video recorder, an audio recorder, we can edit all of that. We can go live from any location right from our phone just by opening uh, an app. So that's pretty powerful and pretty transformational when you think about it when before um, you would have to go out with um, big bulky equipment. So then we see uh, this evolution also happening beyond the New York Times. Um, on the left-hand side, which is really interesting, this was 2013. This was a photo taken with an iPhone by a professional photographer. Um, and the photographer actually used a filter, an Instagram type filter. Um, that photo was the front page photo of the New York Times of a New York, a Yankees, uh, New York Yankees baseball player. Um, again, that's pretty, pretty incredible to think that the New York Times, a photographer for them took a photo that made it to the front page just with a mobile device. And this has continued, right? So on the right-hand side, um, this is an image taken with an iPhone of some of the, the protests here in the United States regarding racial injustice. Um, and so this is no longer a novelty. This is just part of how we do our jobs. Um, and these are images taken from the last year or so. You know, we have on the upper left-hand corner of your screen, um, we have a crew from a national news network here, ABC News, in uh, New South Wales, Wales call it covering brush fires. And all they're using is a mobile device with a microphone plugged in um, to go live and also record video. Um, I'm going to play this video. I thought this is a good example of, particularly during the pandemic, how the use of mobile devices in journalism was extremely helpful, right? Because when you think about it, the mobile device gives you access in ways that you might not have had before with a big bulky camera, right? Um, it's much more personal as well. So one thing um, I have found is that think about it. If you show up to interview someone and you have a big camera, oftentimes they are so timid and afraid. So what this has really done is it has allowed people you interview and approach to be more willing to chat and to be more comfortable. It's a much more natural experience to do an interview with an iPhone and be interviewed with an iPhone or a um, an iPad or any kind of mobile device you may have, even if it's not an iPhone, uh, than with a big bulky camera. I'm gonna play this video, it's a, a couple minutes long. This is a journalist who um, was using mobile devices, smartphones, and a mobile journalism kit um, well before the pandemic. So she was fully prepared when the pandemic started to use these in ways that many other journalists were not yet using them. Um, as many of you know, um, during the pandemic, and we're obviously still in the pandemic, 
many newsrooms and news outlets went completely remote, right? So they were working from home, they were using just iPhones. Those journalists who had already been experimenting and already using mobile devices were well ahead of the game in terms of being prepared. Uh, so let me play this video and then I will, um, I will be back on the screen. So I'm gonna uh, click this on, should take us to the video. Uh, let me make sure the audio is working. Okay, so this is from the Thompson Foundation, which provides actually smartphone and types of training regarding mobile journalism, uh, among other topics. Um, and this is a video they had posted to uh, back in February to their Instagram page, just about journalistic tools, the smartphone, how, is it, how it's enabled mobile journalism and continued to tell the, the human stories of COVID-19 despite uh, the restrictions. The problem was that everyone Please let me know, uh, Professor, if you cannot hear the audio, but I think yeah. you should be able to yeah, hear it. audio is there, Anthony. Okay, thank you so much. I was locked at home. We couldn't go in. When we were alone into the hospitals, we used the phone to feel. Moyo is opening a new era for mass media, for, for journalists. My name is Leonor Suarez. I'm a journalist. I work for the public television of Asturias in Spain. I run a weekly program. And the smartphones were key to be able to keep the show on air because most of the people that uh, work on this show uh, started working from home. We use the smartphones and the Mojo kit to film ourselves, to anchor the show. When we were allowed into the hospitals or the nursing homes, sometimes they just allow one person of the team. It's difficult to film with a big camera in places because of the intimacy or something like this. What we did in those cases uh, was we used the phone to film. We were able to film in places, otherwise uh, we would have not been able with the traditional approach. The problem was that everyone was locked at home. We couldn't go in because of health and security reasons. So we asked people to film themselves. In order to do so, we coached them to obtain good quality clips and material. Movimientos lentos. Now we are able to ask someone to film and send us the video that opens the door for you to tell the stories of people, no matter how far those people are, no matter the fact that you don't have expensive technical resources. What we have to do as journalists is taking advantage of the best thing of technology, but never stop doing our job, never outsourcing our commitment. What we have to do is focus on producing good stories and doing good journalism. That's all. The problem was that everyone... So I'm going to uh, stop sharing that and come back to the screen because I just want to point out a couple of things about that um, clip. So I think two things. One, if you notice, she mentioned at the end is just because we're using mobile devices and devices that everyday citizens now have access to, doesn't mean that it's any less of quality in terms of journalism, right? We're still looking for good stories. We're still looking for good sources. We're still looking for uh, being accurate and we're still looking for doing good research. So none of that, you know, just because we're using this doesn't make those things go away. So I, I just want to point that out. And, um, and you, you, you all know that obviously as journalism students, as young journalists, you know how important the fundamentals of, of journalism are, no matter the type of device or in the matter of the platform where you're publishing, whether it be uh, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, you name it, TikTok, um, we still need to be factually accurate and provide the best possible information we can that's well-researched. The other interesting thing uh, that I hope you all uh, picked up on, I hope you all noticed is what I think is really interesting is that because so many people now have access to mobile devices, we as journalists can now ask people 
for example, during the pandemic, maybe when we can't get access to a certain place because of the situation we're in, we can now ask people to use their mobile devices to shoot video, right? To shoot video we want to use in a report and send it to us. And I think that's really, really interesting because that for the majority of the history of journalism was not the case, right? Because you needed to have a bigger type camera that was expensive to actually shoot video. It wasn't easy to get that video to a journalist. But now let's say you are covering, um, let's say you are covering uh, something and you can maybe only interview the person via Zoom and record it. And you're wondering, well, I need video, right? I need video of inside where they are, their natural environment and photos. And you might not have access to that. Maybe it's because of distance, you can't get to the place or it's because of the situation room with COVID and you're not allowed to get close to them or have access. We can ask most people nowadays are pretty um, skilled, right? At shooting some basic video and being able to send that to us some way. Um, so keep that in mind as you kind of think through um, as a mobile journalist, how you could use these tools um, and ask the, the audience or your sources to help out uh, in that regard. Let me share my screen again and I'm going to pull up my presentation, uh, open that up again. So the, I think the interesting thing with um, the, the mobile device and iPhone, it, as it may be in this case, is how close you can get to stories, right? Because with this, you can get very intimate with people interviews and they feel very natural around the, the camera. There are a couple of people who do this very well around the world. Um, Mike Castellucci is a friend of mine here in the US. Philip Bromwell um, is over in RTE, which is a, um, uh, a news network uh, overseas. And so these are some people who um, you might want to consider following. They are full-time, I should say Philip is a full-time journalist. Mike Castellucci is, he teaches and he still, uh, he still works um, producing content using just an iPhone. So let me show you, uh, let me show you an example of, let's see, Philip's work. Uh, Cause I think it's well done and it highlights some of the um, interesting things that I will about to um, show you in terms of uh, video, in terms of audio. Um, so let's take a look at this and then I will highlight, pull out some of the highlights of what I think are done really, really well. I should mention this is completely shot with an iPhone, as he mentions here. Uh, he had shot this in iPhone 8 Plus and edited using uh, Luma Touch, which is a video editing app that is pretty high quality. Um, but I will say that you can produce some high quality videos uh, with a couple of other apps, including iMovie, and I'll talk about that shortly. When I was in my country, I really dreamed to like learn how to play the piano. Alongside the stage at Mosny, where the stars of the show band era once played, a 14-year-old from Damascus is lost in music. Every time I play, I just go to another world, like. And when I'm stressed, when I'm happy, when I'm sad, when I'm... I just go start playing the piano. Remarkably, Alma only started playing the piano six months ago. She is self-taught. I learned some songs like by ear, but I watched some YouTube videos to like help me how to... like for my finger movements. For a family who suffered years of separation during Syria's civil war, Alma's talent came as a complete surprise. I didn't understand who, how can she do that? Because I didn't hear her before and uh, she didn't have any class for piano. Even professional musicians 
who share their skills with Mosni residents have been taken aback. It's a little bit scary. <laughs> it's like, you know, you've given, you know, Alma's had access to, to the instrument and the space in which to play with it. Um, and being able to see a young person develop and find themselves through music, um, there are no words really. Having discovered a passion for the piano in Mosny, Alma now hopes her family can find a home of their own in Ireland. A home with a piano, of course. If I move to a new to a house, I'd buy a, like a real big piano. It'd be like, oh my God, a piano in my room. <laughs> like, it's better for me. So I want to highlight a couple of things with that. One, the story is all about the characters in this, right? Particularly this, this young girl. And so um, that is key. Like, you know, he found a, a very compelling character, right? It's a human element that draws people in a very unique story. Beyond that, uh, you would never know, right? You would have no idea that the iPhone was used to shoot all video and he also edited on the iPhone using an app. Um, why? Well, a number of reasons. He didn't forget about the fundamentals of both audio and video, right? So we have high quality audio. It's very clear. The natural sound, right? The, the sound of the music. Um, that's something that really draws people in. And then we have the wonderful variety of shots, right? And the iPhone really allowing him to get very close into some things. There's a variety of shots. We have wider shots, we have medium shots, and we have those really nice close-up shots, right? And so that provides a very engaging variety of uh, visuals that draw people in. The shots are also steady, right? So there's not a lot of shakiness. So he clearly used some sort of uh, some sort of tripod uh, with with the iPhone. Um, so this is a, an example of, you know, what we kind of aim for with the quality in terms of uh, in terms of mobile journalism. This is very professional, very well polished. Um, and I use that as an example because um, it is obviously extremely well done. Uh, let me share my screen again. And I want to run through, so you, you all may be wondering, let me go back, share my screen. You all may be wondering, so like, what kind of gear, um, you know, what kind of gear should I be using? Uh, so I'm sorry, I, this keeps going back to the first slide, but here we go. There I am. So there's a number of ways you can go about this. Um, so I would say that some people like using and have access to something like an iPad mini or other people just use something like the iPhone. Now I will say that the iPhone definitely, um, because it's smaller, I think it is easier to use, right? It's easier to move around. It's easier to uh, do what you need to do as a journalist in the field. Um, so we, in my mobile journalism class, give our students, uh, and I'll show you guys that right now, um, we give them basically a mobile journalism kit. And it includes an iPad mini. It includes a case that the iPad goes onto. It includes a, um, a tripod. And it also includes several microphones that, that, plug, into, uh, that plug into a mobile device. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and show you guys what that looks like. Um, so you should be able to see me. Yes. So this is kind of, it's just a backpack. And inside, basically, you'll find uh, a number of things um, that my students get. All of these can be found pretty inexpensively on Amazon. Um, I think the, if I were to give one suggestion, like I would say the main thing maybe is a microphone, because as you all know, audio with a mobile device can be sometimes challenging. Um, you can find very inexpensive microphones that plug directly into the iPhone uh, on Amazon uh, or just about anywhere online. 
for not much more than I guess it would be here in the US about you know 30 US dollars. Um, but I'll, I'll show you the microphones we use in a minute. Um, we also use a very lightweight um, uh, tripod. Um, basically this weighs, it feels like nothing. It almost feels like air. And this extends, so it actually goes right to, oh, about like my, the height of my head, basically. So you have the flexibility to, um, to have good, steady uh, video. Um, on the top of this is the ability to um, basically put your device into um, some type of case and it screws right on the top of here. So for example, let me show you the, the iPhone, what we use to, to um, here we go. So we use something like this. Uh, again, these can be found just about anywhere. And basically the iPhone, uh, it goes right in here, right? And so I can actually, whoop, sorry, it's making a sound. So I can actually use this without a tripod and it provides wonderful stability, like really, really good stability to get the shots I need in terms of um, steady shots. Uh, this is called, just so you guys know, this is called square uh, jellyfish, but there are so many of them out there um, and you can find them in stores and you can find them online. This end right here screws right onto uh, the tripod I just showed you. So I could use this like this, which is pretty steady, like it provides a lot of stability, or I could attach it to a tripod. Um, so this, I think is uh, key if you're using a mobile device, because this provides the stability because there, there, are, I would say two things, two downfalls, right? Two challenges we have with using just mobile devices. One is steady video. So this helps with that. Two is audio, right? The audio is, is really good overall, even without a microphone. However, there are times when you're in a situation and you need to interview someone and there's a lot of background noise and a, using a microphone helps out with that, right? It helps just get the audio of the person you're interviewing. So let me show you a couple of microphones that we have. Um, the one I really like is, this lavalier mic. Um, so you clip this right on to the person you're interviewing and the other end uh, goes right into the, the mobile device. Um, and this is very, very inexpensive. It sounds perfect, the audio. Um, so that is, for me, if I were to choose a microphone, I would get something like this that plugs directly into your device and that you can clip onto this shirt of whoever you're, you're interviewing. Now, the other microphone we also use is uh, this Rode kind of um, natural sound mic. And this is just to get kind of good natural sound. Uh, I think this is a great microphone, but if I had to choose between the two, I would prefer to just have the lavalier. Um, because I think the, the audio on interviews is so important. If you don't have good audio on your interviews, then it's going to be very difficult for your audience to, to follow that. Let me share my screen again. So let's talk about audio. I recommend um, when you're recording video, and audio. Uh, obviously, if you're recording video, you're you're also getting audio. I recommend putting your device in airplane mode. The reason why is that if you end up um, if you end up uh, receiving a phone call while you're recording, or you're receiving notifications from social media, that can cause some issues with your audio, and so it may be audible. For example, if you're receiving a call while you're interviewing someone, that's going to create an issue. 
Um, obviously, uh, it is very, very important to listen to what you recorded before leaving the, the location. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than when you've interviewed someone, particularly someone important, and you realize that the audio doesn't sound good, right? So you'd rather know that at the location than when you get home. This happens uh, somewhat frequently, I would say, with, with my students, uh, at least a couple times every semester, is that they are recording an interview, right? And they're not using a microphone. So they're using this microphone uh, native to the uh, mobile device and they have covered the microphone. And so what ends up happening is the audio of the interview is all muffled and scratchy and you cannot really hear the audio. So just make sure if you're using, um, when, you, when you use your mobile device, if you're not using a microphone that you're holding it in a way that you're not covering the, um, uh, the, the microphone on the device. When you interview, um, and this, you know, might depend nowadays considering the COVID situation with how close you can actually get to the person, but particularly if you're not using a microphone, the closer you get to the person you're interviewing, the better the audio is going to be. Um, so just something to, to keep in mind. If you're far away from the person, interviewing them, the audio probably is not going to be as good. So let's say you're covering a, a protest and you wanna interview someone like the organizer of that protest. Um, I recommend bringing them away from any background noise. So let's say there's a lot of cheering and chanting um, regarding the protest and you want to interview someone, uh, you have to be careful because it's great to have that in back of you, but then the background noise may be too much and you might not be able to hear the person uh, you're interviewing. Finally, like I mentioned, in a best case scenario, use an external mic. It helps out so much. Let's talk video. Um, here's what I find. I find that uh, sometimes, um, Young journalists, like my students, I find sometimes think uh, that because they're using an iPhone or any kind of mobile device, they can just kind of like move around everywhere, right? But remember what is going to differentiate amateur quality video from professional quality video is things like being steady, right? So maintain the same fundamentals that you would if you were shooting on a normal camera. So that's steady shots, not a lot of movement, moving around and getting the scene from different angles. Because if you stand in just one location, right? If I'm interviewing you and you're standing in just one location, the person watching it on their mobile device or their computer is not gonna be able to get a sense of what you're seeing. So as best as you can, uh, move around and creating a sequence of shots. What does this mean? It means getting shots that are from different angles, but also close up, medium wide. So if I'm interviewing you in the classroom and I'm doing a, a story on you, I would want to get you shots of you very close up, maybe your hands typing on your computer. But then I also wanna move around and get wider shots, right? That provide context. That's really important. I'll show you some examples of that uh, shortly. I'm just looking at my watch to see where we are in time. Okay. Um, short clips. Uh, I recommend not having clips that you record any longer than three to four minutes. So if you're interviewing someone, I recommend that you stop recording when they've finished an answer to your question, and then you start recording again. Here's why. If you have a 10 minute interview clip on your phone, sometimes that can be very difficult um, when you get it into an editing system. It can cause the editing system to crash if you're editing on your iPhone. So I recommend having very short clips. They're easier to work with. So do you shoot horizontal or do you shoot vertical? It depends, right? If, if you are creating a story for Instagram, for example, an Instagram story, 
your content needs to be vertical. If you are shooting for um, video for maybe to be embedded in a website story, horizontal is better. So it just depends on the platform that you're producing the content for. And zoom with feet, what does this mean? This means if I wanna get a close up of something, actually walk up close to it and don't use the zoom feature, uh, the pinch feature on your device because the quality will not be as good as if you get right up close uh, to that. So I've talked about this, wide shots, medium shots, close-up shots, very important. Moving around, don't stay in one space. The, those close-ups, so the close-ups give us details. They give the viewer details that you see because you're there, but they wouldn't be able to see. So it may be that, for example, that piano story, it may be getting very, very close up and getting her playing the piano, right? That gives us details and brings us to the scene in a way that a wider shot wouldn't. Um, if you're interviewing someone, it's best to interview them in their natural environment. So like, let's say I'm interviewing an athlete and they're training for the Olympics. It's better to get that athlete, let's say they're uh, a swimmer. It's better to interview that athlete at the pool where they train versus in their home, sitting down on a couch or a chair, right? Because that's their natural environment and it, it tells the story in a better way. I always ask them to mention their name and what they do with their title. So for example, can you just tell me your name and who you are? So I'm Anthony Adornado. I'm a journalism professor at Ithaca College. Because a lot of times I like using that in the video I'm producing, right? So they can introduce themselves. And so a lot of times I find that very, very helpful. Um, I'm gonna, uh, five more minutes and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. Uh, I'm, didn't get through everything, but that's, that's fine. I'd rather uh, chat a little bit. So this is an example of um, kind of different shots. It's called a five shot method. So the different shots you could get in terms of one particular scene. Um, and so we're talking about like the close up. We're talking about wide shots. We're talking about over the shoulder gives a different perspective. Um, let me play this video. And this gives a great example of what a five shot sequence looks like and then how it all comes together. So that gave you an, an idea of, right, the different shots that were taken and then how they came together. Um, so I like playing that video because I think it does a really good job of hitting home the point of, of, of sequencing, basically. Uh, this stuff I'm gonna skip through. Um, let's see here. So this is an exercise that um, I have my students do. So it's something that you guys can keep in mind. Uh, and it, it would be a good exercise if you haven't done something like this. 
But what I have my students do to learn how to do the sequencing is I have them record with a mobile device an interview with a classmate about anything. Um, it can be about what they did this weekend. It can be about what they do in their free time. So they record that interview and then they shoot a five shot sequence of that person doing something, right? So it may be that it's a five shot sequence of your classmate um, working on their computer, uh, drinking a cup of coffee or reading a paper. Um, it can be really anything, right? Um, I tell them to shoot in horizontal mode. And then what I have them do is I have them then take all that um, uh, video, uh, including the interview, and I have them basically create what you just saw. I have them create a video that includes uh, an interview and then over it is a five shot sequence. And they find it to be very, very helpful in terms of learning how to create um, a five shot uh, sequence. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of this stuff because I do want to, before I open it up, I do want to go through, I'm gonna skip through this right now, but I want to go through, um, and this is a, a mix of both mobile, but also social. So I want to go through how to create and what to think about when you're creating uh, the Instagram type stories. So I don't have to tell you guys, you guys know that these vertical stories are really, very popular right now. And a lot of emphasis within newsrooms is being placed on creating these immersive stories on Instagram in vertical format. Um, you know, they're the type that engage people, but engage a younger generation, right? So many newsrooms are figuring out how they can attract a younger generation. So this is one way uh, to do that. This quote here is from uh, Corey Hayek, who's um, basically heads all of digital for Vice. And, you know, she, she says that this vertical story format, she, you know, she considers to be the future, future of visual storytelling. And so Vice, for example, like many other outlets are putting a lot of attention on just vertical uh, stories that are tappable. Um, some general guidelines, like uh, the story needs to have an arc, right? So like these Instagram stories need to be thought through. Just because it's Instagram and it's not more of a traditional platform doesn't mean it doesn't have to have a good character, good information, and an arc to the story. So typically, in order to get to be able to tell an almost complete story, you're going to need at least six to 10 different elements to tell that. Anything less really wouldn't provide enough for uh, the audience. I say the story must provide meaningful information. So I say this because I think sometimes people think, oh, it's an Instagram story. Oh, it's for TikTok. And so the information doesn't need to be as important or credible or factually based as, as if I was doing it for a website or TV. And to me, that's not the case at all. Like, you should still be providing meaningful information. Um, what I tell my students is to create an arc to the story, right? So it still needs to, the story still needs to have some sort of beginning, middle, and end. Um, and obviously, you're thinking about how you can use the features of, for example, Instagram stories, such as polls and questions. So what I have my students do is, before they even think about opening the device and posting, uh, an Instagram story, I actually have them storyboard. So, you know, you can do this on hand with your, there are many templates out there like this one, but they simply, I have them do it by hand, slide one. And they tell me like, okay, here's the, here's the image or here's what's going to be on that slide in the text, slide two. So this allows you to think through, right? You handwrite it out first. It allows you to think through the arc of a story before you just open your, your Instagram app and start uh, posting it. So for example, this is from an outlet in Canada and they were doing a story about incarcerated uh, indigenous people in Canada. And so this is just showing you a couple of the different elements of uh, the Instagram story. But I think this is a good, example because one, 
the first slide introduces us to a real person, right? So just like you would in a video story for maybe a website, or just like you would in a written article, the first slide is introducing us to a person. We don't yet, we do not yet know who that is. Like we don't yet know when I, when I open this story and see this first slide, I don't yet know who it is, but as I tap through, more information is revealed about this person, right? And not only that, I'm also being given good factual information, right? So I'm being given data and quantitative data that helps add more credibility to, uh, to the story. Um, and it's the same thing with, for example, the Washington Post. These are screenshots from their stories. This is The Economist. These are well thought out, um, but it doesn't matter if it's a high quality kind of outlet, uh, a bigger outlet like this, or if you're doing it on your own for a story you're reporting on. Um, I highly recommend that you storyboard out before you actually start, um, before you actually start sharing uh, the content. I am gonna stop there and I will open it up to questions. I'll toss it back to you, Professor. Um, I mean, as you guys know, I could go on for a whole day about this stuff. So I hope the information I gave, I hope was, was helpful. Um, and I, I could talk forever about this, as you know, so. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Anthony Adonato, for giving this wonderful presentation and uh, uh, within a very limited times. And so we have learned so many things, so many new things. Uh, and I hope there are some questions uh, from my students. And I have seen already uh, 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 some of them already raised their hands. So uh, one by one, I will, uh, will give you all the chance to ask questions. So first, uh, first Zana, uh, please, uh, you can ask question. Hello, Anthony. Uh, I'm Farzana. I want to know about the challenges of mobile journalism and how to overcome those challenges. You know, people sometimes don't consider a mobile journalist as a professional one. They treat a mobile journalist differently from a journalist with a camera. They think that, oh, she is just a content creator or a blogger. So how to overcome the situation? Yeah, so that's a great question because um, you're right, particularly I, particularly, I would say when you're showing up with just uh, mobile gear to certain kinds of, of stories where maybe it's, um, you know, elected officials or politicians or, and they're used to having journalists show up with traditional gear. I think in those cases, um, that's the most challenging situation. But here's what I always say. It's just like prior to the use of mobile devices, if they over time see that you're doing good journalistic work, right? And you're staying true to the fundamentals of being a good journalist, you'll build your credibility over time. But that's not to say that at first there's gonna be some sort of hesitancy around that. Um, so I think that the biggest obstacles I find, at least here in the United States, is that it's, it, can be when you're showing up in situations where there are journalists from other outlets who are using, still using traditional cameras. Um, I find it less though when uh, you're with individuals who aren't kind of, are more just everyday individuals, right? Um, and so I think, I think it's a slow process. I think it's showing that you're producing as good as content as anyone else using, um, using your, your mobile device. And I also think it's part of building your overall journalistic brand, right? So if you, if you have built your kind of journalistic brand online and you can point them to the content that you've been producing, good journalistic content, and you're not just a content creator that no, you are a journalist, then I think if you can send them a link to that, if you can show them the work you've already done, I think that goes a long way. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. All right, then. Uh... I want to move to Rasul. So I think he has a question. Rasul. Hello. Uh, is my voice coming out clearly? Yes, I hear you, Rasul. So I would like to follow up with Farzana. The thing is that, for example, I recently went to interview in a hospital, quite risky endeavor given the current situation, but 
I was not at all even allowed to film or interview despite going right to the ward in charge, who was in charge of the ward and asking for permission. The thing that I saw was, as Farzana said, that when you move in as a news crew, you have this van, you have this recording equipment, you have essentially uh, infrastructure that's backing you up, that automatically adds the weight to your journalistic posture. So how can we have the similar posture while recording? Because as you said, you have, we have to build up a brand. I understand that, but building up a brand does not happen on a single day. I mean, there are cases where like the Floyd murder, it was recorded instant, instantly, and it was a case of citizen journalism. But for us, we're actually trying to make mobile journalism as a profession. How do we as beginners break that barrier where we're, if not taken as seriously as prof mainstream journalism journalists, at least given the similar opportunities to ask questions, to film, so how do we make them understand that this is not just someone who's out there to make something casual or irresponsible? Because there are a lot of yellow journalists out there as well, just filming them with their mobiles and casually posting on their blogs, which are actually creating a lot of disinformation, which was, I think, covered in the US election as well. So given the current situation where there's as much misinformation and post truth in a, in a post truth society. How do we as journalists, mobile journalists, not only are taken seriously, uh, how do we actually create that posture, that behavior that people actually take us seriously? Because now this guy is not just someone who's just going to post on a random blog, he's actually a journalist or wants to be a journalist and actually wants to put the truth out there. Hmm. Yeah, great question. Um... Um, and a, certainly a difficult one to, to answer because trust is built over time and this movement of mobile journalism is built over time. I always tell my students that, again, if you can become part of a group of a movement and it's more powerful, right? So in the sense that, you know, my students who are doing this mobile journalism, they are connecting with many different groups of people to also educate them about why this is important. But beyond that, I think the biggest thing that my students, because you guys have a couple of barriers, right, as students, and then you add on mobile journalism and you may have even more barriers, right? Because as a student journalist, sometimes a young journalist, you're not taken maybe as seriously. And then when you add on the mobile aspect, that can add another layer. I will say for what I have found to be extremely helpful is having a professional posture built in, meaning my students all have professional websites that they point people to. They have business cards that they give people. And I'm not saying that that is the kind of like magic bullet, but it has helped over time um, because if you can point someone to the professional work you're already doing, I think that's really, really key and critical. Um, if you can point them to the high quality stories you're doing, I think that's, that's very, very critical. The other thing is that, um, and I'm not sure how it's structured there, but in, you know, here we've um, made it a point to um, build it into kind of the, our society of professional journalists, right? So we've made it kind of, it's taken a while to get there, but it's made it, we've made it more integrated into um, the journalism profession and our main journalistic organization. Um, it doesn't mean there are people who are like naysayers, um, but it's helped over time. So I don't have a, I guess I don't have a perfect answer for that. I think it's just slow and continuing to do good journalism, but also showing them that even though you're not atta attached to a mainstream news outlet, that you're publishing this content in a way that is professional and evidence-based and factual um, over time, because it's not going to, it's, it's not going to happen uh, like that. So it's not, that's, again, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. And it's something we've, that we've faced here, but it's just taken time. I mean, even in, in even in, academia, so even within um, higher education here, right? 
to have a standalone class on mobile journalism that's required, it's very common now, but to get to this point, I mean, I started teaching this in 2013, 2014. And at that point, it wasn't a required class. At that point, it was just, you could take it if you wanted to, and now it's required. Um, but that took a while to get to where we are today. I mean, that took a lot of kind of patience in showing people like, that we're still doing journalism, showing my colleagues we're doing journalism, just it might be in a different way. So can I ask something as a follow-up? Yes. The... yes. So I have seen deep fakes and I have seen misinformation out there, more misinformation out there than there is valid information. And most of it is by the look of the content, you can see that it's been hurriedly created in a as professional way as possible, but it's you can't always this uh, what can I say differentiate between what's professional and unprofessional because these days everything is written in sh very short forms because people's attention span is short so a smart small form of content is what people go for because most of most people use their mobile as their news source now nowadays so how do we as some as people who are trying to actually uphold the truth combat misinformation yellow journalism and essentially everything that actually discredits us yeah no i mean it's a it's a obviously a question a question that we talk about all the time i think one of the things is you know, social media provides us with an opportunity to show people what we do as journalists behind the scenes. I talk about this all the time in my class, and it's actually something that I actually require my students to do during the reporting is show people what you're doing to get that interview, what you're doing to double check those facts. Because here's the thing is that the majority of people do not understand what we do as journalists, that it really is being, it's a researcher to a large extent. And that's not the necessarily the fault of the audience because I do think us as journalists are partly responsible for that because you know over the years, we have not been kind of educating the public on what it is behind the scenes we're doing to get that story and the process it takes. So I think one of the things is lifting the veil on that process. So like for me, for my students, I say it's just as important to show people behind the scenes what you're doing to fact check what you had to go through to get the information, than the final product, because it, it does give us it might be a very small portion of people who are following you, but it gives them a sense of, okay, while they're going through all that, or they did this now, listen, at the end of the day, there's a whole lot of people who aren't going to care. But I always tell my students that it's better to focus on the people who, a small core of people who are gonna care than try to take everyone in. Because here's the thing, you're not, you're not going to win over everyone. And so focusing on a smaller group to me is just as important as, yes, I would love to win over everyone. But the fact of the matter is you are, you're just gonna be chasing people forever to convince them that what you're doing is, you know, honest to God, the truth and true journalism. Um, so I think social media presents an opportunity to lift the veil on the process and show people what we're doing behind the scenes to, to, to get the story basically. But it's, it's a hard fight because you're, even when people are presented with what they know is misinformation, as you guys know, so many people still yes. will share it and spread we, it because it yes, affirms- it affirms what they believe, right? And they don't care if it's, um, they don't care if it's not accurate. All right, so uh, do you have any more questions? We can take another question to Anthony. Is there anyone? If there's no one else, I'd like to ask one more. <laughs> if it's okay, sir. Yeah, you can. Let, just uh, uh, now. Nah, let's give everyone a chance. If anybody yeah, else wants to, is there any anyone has any, any any interest to ask questions? If they're not, then we can move to you again. Uh, just let me see. No more questions. All right, Asul. So you can ask. 
Okay, so this question is a bit tricky because I don't think it's a tricky, tricky for you, I guess, but I have seen this happening a lot. There's actually two parts of this question. One is that advocacy journalism, and I have seen the dangers of it because media nowadays seems more and more polarized. And another thing is the platform, for example, Google and Facebook, they seem to be a bit polarized too. They seem to promote some content and they seem to demote other content. For example, I'm a history buff and I like to follow military history. So I see those content creators who focus on military history in YouTube getting their channels demonetized. So from a journalistic point of view, how do you make sure that the content you're creating is not only impartial, but at the same time, how do you maintain it so that you don't become a target for the for giants like Facebook or Google? Because if they take you down, you lose a lot of your major platforms because most people get the news from either Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. And let's face it, a few large companies control these channels, which have essentially been it being centralized in our mobile. Yeah, I mean, you obviously hit home a great point is that the tech companies control the, they, they are the avenues to our audience, right? Where before we did not have to worry about that, but they hold the keys to our audience. Um, the first thing on advocacy journalism, uh, it is all the rage right now, even here in the United States, meaning that this term has popped up and I see a lot more students also interested in this, but they might not fully understand what it is. Um, the way I see it is that journalism in general is a form of advocacy, but with an asterisk, right? Like even traditional journalism, because you are trying to take fact-based evidence and find the truth, right? But oftentimes that doesn't mean, like if it's an issue of human rights, that doesn't mean you should be impartial. Like that doesn't mean you should not say, no, the facts show this, right? It doesn't mean that you're biased. It just means that you're, you're telling what it is, how you have arrived to that truth, right? And so we're having a big discussion about this here in the United States, obviously around the issue of race and injustice, because you can't take a middle line around that. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming, or it's just like the evidence is overwhelming for climate change. So being, there's a risk of being 100% impartial or being 100% balanced, right? I mean, if we talk about climate change, if we give uh, equal time to climate change naysayers that we do to, to, you know, people who believe there is climate change, well, we're not doing our job as journalists because our job is to tell the truth. And that's actually not a balanced report considering overwhelmingly we know the research shows the effects of climate change. So I think to start with, that is an important point I want to make. And it's an important point I increasingly make to my students, because I, I do think there's a belief in journalism that and there has never been by me, but I, I do think the way it's taught, at least here in the United States, is that we always need to be impartial. And if we're not impartial, it means we're taking sides. But to me, that's actually not the case because we're using data to say this is the way it is, or perhaps this is the way it not it isn't. So I just want to make that clear because I think it's important. However, on that same aspect, I do think on that same note, I do think that there has to be guidelines within newsrooms that say we aren't in this to take necessarily intentionally take a side. It's where our fact checking and our research takes us. And so I think that's important. Um, that's an important point. Now, there are plenty of, there are plenty of, I don't want to even want to call them news organizations, but there are plenty of, I guess, outlets that are popped up that, that do take more of an advocacy approach. One American nothing, news. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but where it becomes confusing is that to me, that's not necessarily journalism. It's more of a traditional advocacy role. And so that is, and we get in sometimes heated discussions with my students about this because they sometimes disagree with me, but I don't think that's necessarily journalism. I mean, if you're intentionally coming at it with, this is the perspective I'm coming at it, and this is the slant I'm going to take, 
then that's not traditional journalism. Now, the whole idea of um, the algorithms and monetizing, uh, that's a difficult one because the trap we don't wanna fall into as journalists and the trap that some news outlets do fall into like clickbait, for example, is that, oh, we're only producing content that we know or in a way that we know is going to get the most clicks, whatever, uh, on Facebook or wherever it might be. And um, obviously can be more monetized for us. And so that's, that's tricky. But my whole thing is that, and we have been doing in this in the US more and more is that we can no longer as journalists, as news organizations say, Facebook, Twitter, Google, the tech companies are there, the journalism industry is here, and Facebook, we think what you're doing is awful. And I agree, Facebook in many ways is what they're doing unethical um, and questionable, but we have to work together because the fact of the matter is they own the channels to our audience. Um, and it's only gonna, it, I guess we're only gonna get where we need to be or baby steps if we somehow try to work together. The algorithm thing though, and in terms of monetizing is, I mean, listen, if you're a journalist, I get it, you need to make money, but if on the same token, uh, you need to stay true to what no, it is. I was just giving an example. I did not yeah. talk about okay. monetization. I was just giving an example. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. So we are almost at the end of our masterclass. So if we come back to our topic, that was uh, the mobile journalist and from the field. Uh, so uh, with the line of this, uh, I, just, uh, I just want to say, according to the Anthony, I don't know from his book. Uh, today we can't discuss journalism uh, without the monumental impact of mobile devices and social media. And the two things that dramatically changes the whole scenario: how uh, the job responsibilities of journalists should be in the next couple of years, and how the news organization produce their content and how they can deliver the content because there are a lot of platforms that are available there. So you have to think about it as where you will su submit or publish your content as already Anthony mentioned. Uh, sometimes you can go with the vertical videos for Instagram or sometimes you, uh, you can go with the horizontal landscape for television or YouTube. So a lot of challenges are coming on from, for the aspiring journalists like you. So I think this is the right time to prepare yourself for the industry, which is waiting for you. So I want to thank uh, Anthony Adonato for giving his time and chat with my students. And it was a pleasure having you here. And, uh, and I believe you also enjoyed the conversation. And uh, we also uh, eagerly waiting for our next meetup. And uh, I would also be thankful to you if you, Anthony, provide some suggestions and tips whenever my students will contact with you. And I hope we also can uh, do some sort of uh, uh, seminar with your students and with me students and we can discuss uh, some different aspects of mobile journalism from the US perspective and from the Bangladesh perspective. Yeah, no, this was a great discussion. Um, and yeah, that would be amazing because the as as uh, you know, the the way mobile journalism is evolving is so different in different countries. So it's really it's really interesting to see. Um, and we can all learn from each other. So this, yeah, this was great. I'm happy to collaborate um, in the future. Um, and again, for any of you who have any questions, feel free to contact me. You know, you know how to reach me um, via any social media platforms or email. Yeah, I will share your uh, Twitter handle and Facebook account with me. Excellent. So I think they will. Excellent. Continue. Excellent. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anthony, and have a good day. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. So, thank you so much. I Saturday day, up another road, say, meet term to say. So, come on, legacy overall session. How good are the best chill? So, okay, we follow Korea or Hotse, best on it, Bosch Dore. এবং ওর বইটা যেটা আমি শুরুতে বলেছিলাম মানে এইটা যদি হচ্ছে আপনারা একবার পড়তে পারেন মানে দিস ইজ আই ক্যান সে দা মাদার বুক অফ মোবাইল জার্নালিজম মানে এত কিছু ডিটেইলসে ও নিয়ে আসছে এবং এতটায় আসলে হচ্ছে যে মানে আপডেট ইনফরমেশন 
যেগুলো আসলে হচ্ছে আমি কোথাও কোন বইতে বা অন্য কোথাও পাইনি তো এইটা পড়ে আসলে হচ্ছে ওর সম্পর্কে আমি জানতে পারি এবং ওর সাথে আমি যোগাযোগ করি টুইটারে তারপর ফেসবুকে এবং অনেকদিন ধরেই এই বছরের শুরু থেকে আসলে হচ্ছে যে ওর আমি স্কেজুয়াল চাচ্ছিলাম বাট ও এত ফ্রিকুয়েন্টলি ট্রাভেল করে এবং ও হচ্ছে ইটালিয়ান ইটালিতেও হচ্ছে যে ও একটা ইউনিভার্সিটিতে পড়ায় ভ্যাকেশন ইটালিতে আসে আর হচ্ছে অন্য সময়গুলোতে হচ্ছে নিউ ইয়র্কে থাকে সো মিলছিল না মিলছিল না আসলে হচ্ছে যে কখনো সময়টা দিবে বাট এই ফোরটিন অগস্ট ও হচ্ছে বলে রেখেছিল আমাকে গত মাসে বাট আমি খুব মানে টেনশনে ছিলাম আমি হচ্ছে এটা অর্গানাইজ করতে পারবো কি না কারণ আপনারা জানেন আমি একেবারেই হচ্ছে যে মানে বেডে ছিলাম সো ফাইনালি থ্যাংকফুল টু আল্লাহ মাইন্ড আল্লাহ যে এটা আসলে আমরা করতে পেরেছি এবং ওর কাছ থেকে এই সময়টা আমরা পেয়েছি এবং যতটুকু হচ্ছে যে ও ডিসকাস করেছে আরো কিছু চেয়েছিল বাট ও হয়তো সময় দিতে পারেনি আমি সেশনটা রেকর্ড করেছি সো আমি আপনাদেরকে ডিস্ট্রিবিউট করে দিব একটু রিভিউ করে নিয়েন মোস্টলি হচ্ছে যে যা কিছু বলেছি অনেকটাই হচ্ছে যে আমাদের আলোচনায় হচ্ছে উঠে এসেছে আমরা যে ক্লাস গুলো করেছি মিটার আগে সো নতুন বিষয়গুলোকে হচ্ছে যে এই হচ্ছে যে অ্যাড্রেস করবেন আর আমি ওর কাছে দেখি প্রেজেন্টেশনটা কালেক্ট করতে পারি কি না যদি সেটা কালেক্ট করতে পারি আপনাদেরকে ডিস্ট্রিবিউট করে দিব ঠিক আছে এনি কোয়েশন আমি আপনারা শুনেছেন কিনা আমার ডেঙ্গু হচ্ছে হয়েছিল ফারজানাকে হয়তো বলেছিলাম সবার সঙ্গে তো আসলে কথা হয়নি আমি হচ্ছে যে করোনার টেস্ট করিয়েছিলাম টোয়েন্টি ফোরথে আর হচ্ছে যে তার এক সপ্তাহ পরে হচ্ছে আমার হচ্ছে ডেঙ্গু হচ্ছে যে ধরা পড়ে তো হচ্ছে সেটাও হচ্ছে প্লাটিলেট হচ্ছে এক লাখের নিচে নেমে গিয়েছিল তারপর হচ্ছে আমার একবার সিচুয়েশন হচ্ছে যে এইটটি ফোর এইটটি ফাইভে চলে এসেছিল হয়তো ভেবেছিলাম হয়তো অক্সিজেন লাগবে বা হসপিটালাইজ হতে হবে বাট আলহামদুলিল্লাহ হচ্ছে কোনো কিছুই আসলে সেভাবে মানে একেবারেই খারাপের দিকে যায়নি আহ বাসাতেই হচ্ছে ছিলাম পুরোটা সময় এবং হচ্ছে গ্রাজুয়ালি হচ্ছে ইম্প্রুভ করেছি সো আপনাদের সবাইকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ আপনারা আমার জন্য দোয়া করেছেন আমার জন্য হচ্ছে ভেবেছেন এবং ফাইনালি হচ্ছে যে আমি আস্তে আস্তে রিকভারি করেছি তা না হলে আসলে দুইটা একসাথে অ্যাটাক করা এবং হচ্ছে যে আলহামদুলিল্লাহ এইভাবে আসলে ফিরে আসা আর সবাই খুব টেনশনে ছিল পুরো ডিপার্টমেন্টের হচ্ছে ফ্যাকাল্টির স্টাফরা খুব টেনশনে ছিল সবাই নিয়মিত যোগাযোগ করেছে খোঁজ নিয়েছে সো আলহামদুলিল্লাহ এখন হচ্ছে যে বলতে পারেন রিকভারির হচ্ছে যে অনেকটাই হচ্ছে যে করতে পেরেছি বাট আরো একটা সপ্তাহ হচ্ছে আমার মনে হয় হচ্ছে গেলে আমি হচ্ছে মোটামুটি পুরোপুরি হয়তো ফিট হতে পারব জি স্যার ইনশাআল্লাহ হ্যাঁ আপনারা সাবধানে থাকেন হ্যাঁ নিজের দিকে খেয়াল রাখেন বাসার ফ্যামিলি মেম্বারস দিকে খেয়াল রাখেন মানে সময়টা এতটায় আসলে বাজে এতটায় বাজে মানে আপনি হচ্ছে যে কখন কিভাবে কার দ্বারা হচ্ছে সংক্রমিত হবেন বুঝে উঠতে পারবেন না আপনার ভিতরে কোন ধরনের ইনফেকশন হচ্ছে কিনা সেটা হচ্ছে সঙ্গে সঙ্গে হচ্ছে যে ট্রাক করতে পারবেন হ্যাঁ সো হচ্ছে যে মানে একেবারেই হচ্ছে যে মানে ই করবেন না ফ্রিলি মুভ করবেন না হ্যাঁ যত ধরনের প্রিকশন গুলো আছে সবগুলো মেনটেন করেন কারণ হচ্ছে যে কখন ওই যে বললাম কার দ্বারা আপনি হচ্ছে যে অ্যাটাক করবেন আমার ওয়াইফ সে পুরোটা সময় বাসায় সে আমার আগে অ্যাটাক হয়েছে সো মানে যেটা পুরোপুরি আসলে হচ্ছে যে মানে কিভাবে কোথ থেকে হচ্ছে ভাইরাস আসছে মানে বলা মুশকিল তার উপরে এখন আবার তো ডেঙ্গুর একটা প্রভাব চলতেছে চারের দিকে তাই না তো সব মিলে একেবারে সিচুয়েশনটা আনস্টেবল উনি কোভিড আক্রান্ত হয়ে মারা গেলেন 